Okay, today we're going to talk about the problem or problems with speed shooting. Now, I'm not going to do this in a uh, normal video fashion where we have like B-roll footage and demonstrations. This will be a deep dive uh, where I just sit here and talk through um, the research and historicity of speed shooting. Uh, the one reason is just the time taken to go out and film things is not really worth it. Secondly, we already sensationalize so much of archery that filming demonstrations and stunts really isn't doing anyone a favor. So this is meant to be a serious, straight, grounded talk on the history of archery and the problems associated with speed shooting. Now the goals of this video are, well, threefold. Firstly, it's to address some of the misinterpretations of speed shooting in the context of archery. Um, we'll also address why there is a bit of a stigma around speed shooting. And we'll also raise questions about whether there is uh, room to include speed shooting in any official manner or get it recognized in any way. Uh, this typically isn't important, but because some people don't know who I am and somehow care, uh, I am an archer, obviously. Uh, I'm an archery instructor, I'm an archery coach. I volunteer at a club which mostly teaches Olympic recurve and other modern archery. I do shoot and study traditional archery, including Western and uh, Asiatic thumb draw. I do collaborate with a Ottoman archery group in Australia. That said, none of this should matter. The relevance of someone's skill uh, in archery or qualifications in archery would have no bearing whatsoever on the history of archery, because being a good archer doesn't make you a good historian. Far too often in this field of archery, especially online, people will put value on the might is right aspect, where if someone can shoot 10 arrows in 5 seconds, they must be a good archer, therefore they must know about history. Likewise, people go to me and say, oh, look, you shoot a big recurve, you're just jealous that uh, people back then didn't use your bow. I don't give a crap. I know that a uh, in Syria isn't running a camel with an Olympic recurve bow with sight and stabilizers. I'm not trying to self insert myself in history. That, that isn't the point. The point is what is relevant in the discussion. And as it stands, uh, as much as I have a background in archery, it really shouldn't matter. Just like owning an M1911 doesn't make you an expert in World War II infantry tactics, being good at archery doesn't automatically give you the right to rewrite history. Now there are several uh, commonly spread uh, myths and you'll see this most often in comments on online forums, on YouTube videos, and you'll see these particular ones quite often. The first is the specific value that historical archers could shoot three arrows in one and a half seconds. It's a very specific number. The second myth we see often is a general umbrella statement that in battle speed was the most important thing and therefore archers had to shoot really quickly. And the last myth is uh, a general notion of archery being used in close range, uh, what we would call CQB, close quarters battle, um, shooting rapidly uh, because of urban warfare, or maybe a scenario where you get ambushed on a road and you have to defend yourself against you know, five bandits or something. Now, one immediate problem with speed shooting is what exactly is speed shooting? Because it's not an official discipline in any style of archery, Again, it was practice, but exactly how, when, why is not really specified. And in modern times, there is no standard of speed shooting. So I want to offer a definition. My definition of speed shooting is a form of archery in which the archer must purposefully develop a style, method, technique, or equipment set that allows him to shoot faster than a typical archer. And that time frame is pretty much under five seconds. Three seconds more specifically, but five seconds is my safe branch. Because an average untrained person can knock and shoot an arrow in under five seconds. Now, there are two distinct differences between the main methods of speed shooting. Uh, people often lump them together, but they're so different that it's not really comparing apples to apples. The first method is more widely recognized as shower shooting, and that involves shooting one arrow at a time, but shooting at a constant rate. So there is a flow of arrows. It's one at a time, but it's shot very quickly, very consistently, and to a steady rhythm. 
The second style is what I would call burst shooting. Not a term which I've seen used in the archery community, but it best describes this particular method where you hold multiple arrows in one hand and you shoot them all in one go. So while it's faster uh, than shower shooting, it only has a limited number of arrows based on how many you hold in your hand. Now, my criticisms of speed shooting will actually cover both of these. Uh, burst shooting has a bit more uh, problems in terms of how it's applied, but equally some of the weaknesses will apply to both. To begin this discussion, I'm going to call back to a game you might have ch played in your childhood, and that is Chinese Whispers, or Telephone, as some of you might know. It's the game where you sit in a circle and one person whispers something to the next person, it goes in a circle until it reaches the end. And you win the game if the person at the end says the exact word or phrase that was started, you'll lose the game when it's wrong. And of course, most of the time you'll probably lose this game. And why do you lose it? Because people often mishear what you say, they misunderstand, they misspeak, and sometimes you have bad players who intentionally say the wrong thing so everyone loses. History is like a giant game of telephone. And since we're talking about uh, speed shooting, especially the context of Arab archery, let's go through a hypothetical situation which illustrates the problems of studying archery in the context of its history. So we're going to share a story of a law who lived during the Ayyubid Caliphate and he is a little concerned because in his land it's mostly uh, an agricultural society, they're all farmers and nobody seems to want to fight. And around him uh, he's got a few problems. Up north we have the Turks, on the coast we have the Crusaders and on the east we have rumours of a people called the Mongols who may or may not be friendly. So, being a little concerned about the readiness of his people to defend against invasion, he decides to uh, have a bit of a uh, motivational campaign. So he goes to his scribe Isaac, and he tells Isaac, write me something that will inspire the people. Now Isaac comes from a small village called Rambu, and a long time ago there was a, a local story about a bandit called Yaya. Uh, this bandit shot a farmer, he was imprisoned, and then he escaped. And that's basically all there was to it. Now, Isaac wasn't there, but he knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who was there. That's close enough. So he wants to use this story as inspiration for a real motivational story that shows the best of someone's skills and qualities. But to make this a bit more uh, inspiring, he decides to change uh, a few details. So he produces a work called Kitab Our First Blood. So in the Book of First Blood, we have this character. His name is Yaya Al Rambu. And instead of being a bandit, he is a member of the elite royal green turbans. He was captured during a mission by the Turks and imprisoned behind enemy lines. During one moment, he escapes from his prison, runs 10 miles, swims across a river, then wrestles with an enemy guard, takes his horse, and while escaping on horseback, he uses the bow to shoot five pursuers in less than five seconds. This story is amazing. It is repeated by the kids, it's told by the elders, and it's so successful that Isaac makes several sequels. Now, exactly how many sequels is a bit confusing, the numbers are kind of mixed up, apparently the third book didn't go very well, and the fifth, fifth one was called like Yaya or something, so it was kind of mixed up. But he makes quite a, quite a few books based on Yaya al Rambu and becomes a legend among all the people living at this time. And suddenly, Everyone wants to be like Rambu. They want to learn how to run, how to ride a horse, how to swim, how to wrestle, and how to shoot a bow. And suddenly, the Ayubi Caliphate is a population that is willing to train and defend themselves against enemy invaders, and all is good. Until World War One. Now, the area we're talking about now is being taken over by the Ottoman Turks, and the British are trying to uh, ferment a bit of Arab revolt. So, uh, during this mission, we see uh, a British art collector who may or may not be a spy uh, walk into a shop somewhere near Rambu, and he's poking around some curiosities when he notices a set of texts. 
And he asked the shopkeeper what this text is about. And the shopkeeper, he recalls his favourite memories of the story of Yaya al Rambu. He, he delights the British officer with all these stories and he sells him the book. Only the first one, by the way, not the third one, the first one. And this officer, after the war, brings this book back to Britain, where he, he, he gets it translated, but it sits mostly as a curiosity in a museum. Now, later on, this is discovered by scholars who are curious about what this is. They edit the text, publish a book, and it's sold for limited time. Now it's only available as a PDF. In 2010, an artist in Denmark by the name of Anders Larsen discovers this PDF and reads it himself. And he finds the story of Yaya al Rambu absolutely badass. So he tries to emulate all the things that happen in this book. He makes a YouTube video, it goes viral with tens of millions of views. He goes on podcasts, interviews, and is hired as a consultant to be part of a blockbuster film. This film is delayed by several years, but it's released to a fan film of exactly zero. No one cares, it's a bad film and it bombs. However, it does have some pretty cool YouTube clips and people love the action scenes showing the archery skills of Yaya al Rambu. Of course, I am completely making this up. It's all bogus. Yaya al Rambu is not a real person, nor is it a real story, though I do admire the AI art that I created. That said, the real history of Saracen archery and Arab archery, the text, actually aren't that far different from what I explained. A few details have changed, but that's kind of how the process of the, these books becoming translated into English kind of happened. But nonetheless, the point is that these exaggerations and distortions of history are not unfamiliar. Now, if you know anything about the pop culture of history, you have Spartans, Ninja, Samurai, a lot of these are, of course, real historical people, figures, armies, warriors, but their feats and codes have been greatly embellished over history. And this reflects the distortion of history which we discussed when we played Arab Whispers. Now, we can't assume, as historians, at any point in the process, that every single person was being entirely truthful and tried to record history 100% as it happened. That simply is not the case and is in fact impossible. So we have to understand that every step must be critically viewed. We need to ask ourselves, were the original authors biased in any way? Were they trying to project a certain agenda? Were they trying to twist truths deliberately or make exaggerations consciously or otherwise? Now we have to understand the limitations of the text as well. The original texts were not 100% comprehensive manuals on how to do archery. Now some were more than others. A text like Toxophilus, the earliest English archery text, is very much missing in many details. Whereas a text like The Way of Archery by Gao Ying is a much more comprehensive start to finish manual on how to shoot. That said, while texts like Saracen Archery or Mameluke Archery were quite detailed, it doesn't go into every single detail for every single technique or draw, because that wasn't the goal of this text. It's a treatise on archery in this culture. And on that note, not all these texts were military manuals. Again, some texts were intentionally written for military, such as Gao Ying's The Way of Archery, but Saracen Archery or Arab Archery was a general treatise. It covers archery in all aspects, sport, hunting, and warfare. Many people assume that everything in these books was specifically for the purpose of military or combat, but many sections also cover entertainment, stunt shooting, uh, casual shooting, sport shooting. So we don't always take every single part of this text as meaning one context. Now, on the note of translations, we also talked about how people who access these texts will often access the English versions, because most of us can't read Arabic. Uh, so we read the English versions, and while we don't assume that the English versions were mistranslated or mistaken, we also have to recognize that these are editors who are working hundreds of years 
after the original writers and there are gaps which they too have to fill there are illustrations they have to recreate and there are some compromises which have to be made and acknowledged as missing now in the modern times when people read these texts and they try to recreate these forgotten ideas sometimes we have to invent things to make it look plausible now plausible doesn't mean accurate something that is historically plausible doesn't mean it actually was used or actually happened. It could have, but it doesn't mean it was. And again, every step of this process means someone has changed something. Nonetheless, there are a couple of truths which are undeniable and must be raised. These are hard-hitting facts. One, nobody knows exactly how historical battles were fought. Now you might think, well, yeah, we do. We've got texts, we've got images but no we don't really have a comprehensive account of exactly what happens in a battle we know what the results are who was involved the weapons the the units the the, the ebb and flow of the battle but we don't know the minutiae of the battle who did what and how they fought and you might think, well, hang on, yes we do. We know the Romans use uh, formations, the Greeks fought in a phalanx, Vikings use shield walls, archers shot in large volleys, the sides ran together, they clash, and then they fought this giant blob. But the reality is, uh, uh, warfare was a lot more organized and a lot less chaotic. Um, we don't know exactly how these formations operate on a minute level of detail. We know what they were because they were described, but we don't know how they function exactly. So, how did Romans alternate their front lines? We have shows like Rome, which show rotating front lines, but we don't know how historical that was. Plausible, yes. Accurate, we don't know. And likewise, we don't know exactly how medieval armies fought either. The accounts would describe who fought and where and the result, but not the extreme detail which shows exactly how a person would hold a sword or a shield next to another person, or how an archer shot specifically in any specific context. We just don't know. The second truth is a more dangerous warning. One, because... A lot of people will assume that the person presenting has authority and experience, and more so that some people do take the extreme where they want to use speed shooting as a real-life form of self-defense. Now, as far as history goes, I want to point out with no uncertain doubt that not a single person presenting anything about historical archery has any experience in historical warfare. So I don't care what you would do if you were in a Viking shield war or you were fighting against the Mongols. You are not a Viking in a shield war and you are not a Mongol invading in 13th century uh, Middle East. You weren't there and you have no idea what it was like to fight in those times. So we don't pretend that we knew what they did. But the second problem is the deadly one. And again, a very small handful of people do this, but we all draw the line here. No matter how much we love or hate speed shooting, we draw the line with practical applications of self-defense. People actually think, oh, well, in case I can't use a gun and it's the end of the world, I'm going to use my bow, I'm going to speed shoot, I'm going to defend myself. Here's one simple fact. Nobody has tried. Nobody in the real world has tried legitimate combat experience with a bow. I might think, oh, uh, but people in Kenya use bows. I'm not talking about people standing in a field flipping arrows at each other. I'm talking about real combat, real application, real death. Not a single person has used a bow in anger with deadly effect. So when you have somebody who's providing instruction, whether in real life or on YouTube, who claims that these things would work in a real situation, they are talking out of their ass. If this was a gun channel and they provided fake techniques, they'll be called out for their bullshit. And we're going to do the same with archery. 
Now, with that aside, there are a few fundamentals which are integral to the study of archery. Now, if people who study archery from its text or have a chance to learn it from archery uh, schools, clubs or communities, these will be quite familiar. Unfortunately, many speed shooters go straight to the speed shooting element without paying any attention to the fundamentals. And that means they miss out the things which the text which they reference strongly teach and encourage not the speed side but everything else the holistic archer now islam has five pillars and in the islamic archery text there are also five pillars and these are the five pillars the ability to shoot accurately the ability to strike from distance and with swiftness the ability to inflict injury and the avoidance of harm to one's own self. In simple terms, they must be able to hit their target. They must exploit the advantage of distance, that is, they shoot from a range in which they cannot be hurt. They must shoot with enough power that the arrow can cause injury, that means piercing through shield or armor. They must shoot to an extent where they're not so slow, where they're vulnerable, and they should not be in a position where they're surprised by an enemy attack. Those are the five pillars. Now I raise these five pillars because when you see demonstrations or speed shooting, and not everyone does this, but often the demonstrators who speak the most about practical speed shooting neglect four out of five pillars. They have to speed down, but nothing else. One huge problem, I'm not naming any specific person, but one problem with anyone demonstrating speed shooting is the distance at which they shoot. Now, I understand that due to space limitations and trying to film something, you want to demonstrate in a fairly close range. I do the same thing when I demonstrate. I shoot 10 meters or 5 meters in my shed, so it's easy to show on camera. But that's a limitation which you have to acknowledge and recognize because if you're going to argue that this is a real situation, then a five meter target is way too damn close. That is a distance where if this was a medieval or historical period, that's a distance where someone can walk up to you and poke you with a spear. So there is zero margin for error. If this was a real life modern situation, they've got guns, so you're dead. So the distances are unrealistic. It doesn't show how accurate you're supposed to be, and it's completely forgiving as well as being way too close. Similarly, because there's no focus on the other pillars of archery, the techniques are very sloppy. People take a lot of shortcuts by shooting light bows and half draws and not really holding themselves accountable for any misses. And finally, it's a lack of self-defense. People will always argue that, oh, if you shoot quickly, you can kill five people or you can take the one down with five shots. But this is not something which an archer should be in a position to have to do. If you're in a position where you have to use species and techniques to defend yourself, you're in the wrong position. You are in harm's way and that again violates the principles of the pillars. You're too close, you're in danger, and you're shooting in a way which is not powerful and not accurate. Now, speed shooter proponents also have several fatal assumptions. One is the notion of shooting one arrow per target. I don't, I don't get this. Even with firearms, one shot per target isn't a drill which you rely on. You have to do two or more shots per target. And with the bow, it's even less lethal. And I've seen people do these mental gymnastics. They'll go, oh, but if you hit someone in the eye, it will kill them. Yeah, if you hit them in the eye. If, there's no guarantee you can, especially when you shoot with sloppy speed technique, you won't. So you aim for center of mass, but center of mass will not kill, nor will you hit. Because the, the best assumption is, one, not every shot will hit, and two, not every hit will kill. But people have the idea where if I walked down a hallway and there were three people, I'll get three arrows, one shot each, and they drop dead. That is a Hollywood piece of choreography, not real archery. Similarly, it's having enough arrows. These burst methods specifically, uh, they assume again that you, you will have the right number of arrows in your hand. There are five people, you hit by five bandits or five wolves, you draw five arrows, 
one shot each. What if you don't have five arrows? What if you have four arrows and five targets? What do you do then? And what about if one of your arrows misses or doesn't disable the target? Well, you still got five targets trying to run you down and you have four arrows or three arrows. The assumption of perfect shooting is so fantastical that even in a perfect environment, people don't pull it off. And again, no one demonstrates this. People make excuses. They'll say, oh, uh, well, in a real situation, I would do this. Well, show a real situation. Uh, in a real situation, I would hit all these targets. Well, show that. But many speed shooters avoid this. They'll use camera angles or they'll, they'll leave it off camera and they'll assume that the viewer will believe them. And this is a really disingenuous way to prove how effective something is. Again, this is firearms. It would be quite off of bullshit, but it's okay in archery because the not fast knocking is the skill, not the effectiveness. And again, similarly, problem is when you have compliant targets. And targets don't shoot back. So again, people will set up a, a range, maybe 5, 10 meters at most. They'll demonstrate a speed technique, but the target isn't resisting. It's not moving, it's not trying to avoid being hit, it isn't trying to shoot you back. So having this perfect scenario where you have a range where you can shoot, demonstrate a really cool 10 arrow burst, doesn't matter when the target is not a real target. I'm not saying go shoot real people, but you have to realize that in a real situation, they're not going to let you do that. And you're, again, putting yourself more in harm's way, violating the pillars of archery by doing these weird running acrobatics or flips or bouncing off walls or standing still and shooting 20 arrows. These things are not realistic, practical scenarios. There are also extremely hard limitations. Now, my, the parallel I use here is, say, with uh, muzzle-loading muskets. No matter what you want to do, you are pretty much locked to a, set, to a certain firing rate. You can only load like four, maybe five shots per minute, depending on your training. But once the battle starts, it'll be slowing down to two or three, depending on how well your training is. And archery has a hard limit. And the hard limit isn't the loading speed, it's your physical body. There was an experiment done with Mark Stretton, uh, and Mike Lurtz records this in his book Warbows, or Longbows, um, and where he tried to shoot a 130-pound longbow as fast as it could. He managed 10 arrows in 60 seconds, and that was pushing it. Um, he stated he could not shoot 20 arrows in twice the time, it just couldn't happen. The amount of fatigue that it took to shoot that many arrows that quickly completely ended him. So that's with a military level bow, a heavy war bow. Now with a lighter bow, you probably could shoot more, shoot faster, and be less fatigued. But then you have the second limitation, that's ammunition. You will go through a lot of arrows very quickly. Even shooting at a fairly slow pace, you can empty all your arrows in less than a couple of minutes. Now, your arrows don't weigh nothing. This is not a video game where you can just get arrows and have like 100 in your inventory. You have limited space and you have limited weight capacity. Uh, a typical quiver might carry between 20 to 40 arrows, and at most you might carry two. One at most, but two if you, if you really want to. But even then, that's still not many arrows. Are you really going to spam half your ammunition in less than a minute? Now, some of the criticisms I have for the practice of speed shooting, and again, this isn't reflecting every speed shooter. Some people will be more close to a practical, realistic situation. Others will take a lot of shortcuts. But these are the problems, and a lot of these will correspond to the pillars of archery. The first is using low draw weights. Uh, to shoot quickly, you have to use a low draw weight. 20 pounds, maybe 40. But it's nowhere near like the 80 to 100 pound plus levels which would be expected to use in military archery. These low draw weights, yeah, people say, oh, you can technically kill someone. I mean, you can hunt with 40 pounds, you can kill a person with 40 pounds. Yeah, that's true. Technically, yes, but we're not talking about technically. We're talking about realistically, practically. Would a 40 pound bow inflict fatal injury to someone, considering that they may have a shield or armor? 
that's a problem. And plus, low draw weights have much lower effective range. And you're kind of forcing yourself to shoot within, say, 10 meters, rather than shooting at the 50 plus, which is the effective range of a heavy war bow. Now, the next problem is even if you do use a heavier bow, do you actually draw it correctly? One of the big emphases of archery is a full draw, a consistent draw length that shows the full length and power of the bow. Now, partial draws tend to happen when people take shortcuts. You might have one long draw, but the urgency to get the fastest possible shot means that each draw becomes shorter and shorter and shorter because you're rushing your shots. As each shot becomes shorter, it means that there's less power, less range, less speed. Again, with a short range target, there's almost no penalty. But once you move to 20 plus, 30 plus meters, you'll see that inaccuracy hit hard, or I should say, miss hard, because the arrows will flop everywhere, there's no control, and there's no consistency. Another problem is modified equipment. Now, to attain the highest possible speeds, you kind of have to change your equipment. Now, you can shoot quickly with base equipment, normal arrows, normal bows, yeah, it's quite possible. But some people will get around that by shooting modified knocks. Now, you can buy commercial knocks, which are wider, which makes it slightly easier to knock. But some people go even more than that and they have very extreme wide V-knocks or U-knocks which are very easy to knock. Or they might have a modified quiver. Uh, I'm actually going to reference Mihai Cosme here because he has a very cool quiver which allows him to shoot very quickly using his method of shooting. But this quiver is not an historical quiver. He never claims to be. But while it's plausible that this might be used, it probably would not be have been used in historical times. It is quite a specialized piece of construction, could be made, but very unlikely, and quite excessive for what people might have used back then, but pretty cool. Now, uh, going back a bit, we mentioned the accuracy standard. Um, I find that when people shoot with speed, they only shoot for speed, so they time themselves knocking and shooting, but not really requiring them to hit a target. Again, not everyone does this. Some people do have a target to prove how tight the grouping is, so it validates their shooting. But some speed shooters uh, may just not have a target, have a really easy target, and say, look, I can hit it, therefore it counts. And the last um, shortcut, which I find is just unique to a few people, is uh, having a proper timing method. Now again, because speed shooting isn't a formal discipline, there's no formal rules on how it's meant to be done. Uh, but I've seen speed shooting times and uh, world record claims where if you apply modern timing standards like firearms, they're breaking rules. With a firearm, you go on the buzzer. So you don't know where to start. They'll say, you know, shoot already, beep, and then it's, it starts from that time and it ends on the last hit. Um, but with some of the speed shooting videos I've seen, they start with the arrow pre-drawn and they pre-aim. Then they start timing when they shoot. So they, they be timed from the first shot and end on the last shot. Not the last hit, but the last shot. It's pretty close, so it doesn't matter. But they time on the first shot, end on the last shot. You've chopped out like one, two, three seconds. Um, so it's not really timing. Now, as we reach the concluding third of this presentation, I'm going to raise the question of what exactly are you meant to be speed shooting for? Now, in real archery, I'm drawing upon um, the Ottoman style archery here as a model, but real archery does have specialisms. So we have power, and that's measured through flight. The stronger a bow you can shoot, the further the arrow will go. Hence, the practice of flight archery will measure your ability to shoot a powerful bow with good technique. You also have accuracy as a specialism, and that's measured through target archery. Again, shooting with skill and accuracy. And there is a speed element, and the speed element corresponds to horse archery, which makes sense because as a horse is running, you also have to knock and shoot quickly. So that's where these three have a practical application. But outside of this historical context, what are people imagining a speed shooter would actually do? Because of these three, only one is speed. And even then, 
it doesn't need to be that fast. It has to be consistent to the rhythm, but it doesn't need to be super fast. So these are the questions I would raise when thinking about why people are doing speed shooting. Number one is, how quickly can you physically speed shoot? Now, consideration here is the war bow. Now, not everyone shoots war bow. We understand that. Um, you can still speed shoot with a light bow. But if you're going to apply a military context, it also implies likely a heavier bow, given the context of warfare at the time. So it's one thing to say I can shoot 10 arrows in 5 seconds from a 20 pound bow, but can you shoot 10 arrows in 5 seconds from a 100 pound bow? The second question, which corresponds to my previous point, is how fast do you actually need to shoot? So yes, in theory, someone can shoot 3 arrows in 1.5 seconds, or 10 arrows in 5 seconds. But why though? Why do you need to shoot that quickly? Like, What are you doing? Uh, you're not exactly suppressing an enemy with only 5 arrows, or only 10 arrows. Uh, nor are you inflicting a lot of damage because those ten or five ten shots will probably not hit. If they do hit, it might hit a shield or hit an armor, and if it does go through that, it might scratch them. It might kill them. There'll still be a fighting force. So what exactly is shooting that quickly going to do? And you have to remember that medieval warfare involved more than one archer. You didn't have Yaya Al Rambu being the one super soldier commando jumping around shooting ten thousand guys. It's many archers, thousands of archers who are shooting. And when you have that volume of archers, you don't need speed. So why would you need to shoot that quickly? How long do you need to shoot for? So you have to consider that battles took place over hours. The limitations aren't just like to be full fatigue of ammunition. So there's there's a fixation of shooting as many arrows as you can within like a minute or less. But then you're useless for the rest of the battle. Why do you need to shoot that quickly in such a rapid burst? It's like having a machine gun where, yes, you can shoot 700 rounds a minute, but you've got a 30-round magazine. Are you exposing yourself to any danger here? And I'm going to posit a couple of scenarios, right? If you are in a situation where you can safely speed shoot, you probably shouldn't. And if you're in a situation where you need to speed shoot, you are probably shouldn't be in that situation. The last point may seem stupid, but I have to remind people, bows are not guns. When we imagine situations like urban warfare, close quarters battle, we imagine a modern context where we have uh, self-floating weapons, handguns, rifles, where you know, in our w urban warfare, we have to shoot guns in close quarters. But we are also in an environment where guns are the default weapon. We are not used to combine arms in terms of swords, spears, and bows. We, most people have guns. So in a war environment, you are shooting a gun at people who have guns and tanks and planes and helicopters and nukes, but it's gun on gun. So as a default weapon, all, all people involved in battle are shooting guns at each other. Hence the tactics we evolve to maximize accuracy and hit potential and damage rather than um, having to deal with someone charge you with melee. But in historical battles, not everyone had a bow. And the bow was not the only weapon. In fact, it was seldom the primary mm -hmm. weapon. You had spears, you had pole arms, you had swords. So when the situation is, oh, what if you're in a city and uh, someone attacks you? You probably wouldn't be using a bow in the street or in your house or from a window. You probably are fighting with a spear or a sword and against someone with a spear or a sword. And we have to consider the fell state, the fell condition. If your arrow doesn't hit, the spear will. So we have to get rid of the idea of archery being like a video game where you can do slow motion bullet time and then headshot three people. That's simply not how, how it works. Uh, some of the uh, texts show that there are tactics specifically for city fighting in, uh, in Ottoman archery, for example. But the idea of shooting rapidly with speed, that much speed, not like one arrow every five seconds, but like three arrow burst, that is so extreme that it, it's hard to imagine why some would do that in a real practical situation. Uh, on the historical note, we often have this um, thing where there's 
absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence. And again, I'm not here to prove a negative. I'm not saying that speed cheating was never used. But what I'm challenging is, for those who keep saying that speed cheating was integral to historical combat, I'm asking for proof. Like where where do we see this happening? And we'll see this here, right? So what I'm offering isn't a negative proof, but to show that because of other factors, it is less likely that speed shooting had any relevance or importance in a battlefield. Firstly, in the big picture, bows and archers were not that important. Now, yes, the, if you had them, they were quite an important part of one's army, but they were seldom the decisive element. If you didn't have them, you were at a disadvantage. But at the end of the day, the, the people that won the battles were the infantry that held the line and the cavalry that splashed to the flanks. The archers, rarely, there were very few battles, but archers were the thing that won the battle. So because the archers themselves were not the decisive element, it doesn't really matter what they did, how fast they shot, because they were only one part of the army. In most cases, they were the skirmishers. They were not the main line. They were not the line breakers. They were the skirmishers. So once the skirmishing ended, then the battle began. So that, in that case, it doesn't matter. And likewise, in the big picture, when we talk about big fights and big armies, an individual skill doesn't matter. Uh, we, we, we don't have a main character hero protagonist like Yaya Al Rambu, who is running around killing 100 people by himself, because that's kind of not how battles work. You didn't have these big heroic moments. Uh, rather, it's the macro, sorry, it's, it's the macro side, it's the logistics of battle, it is the supply, the training, the, um, the supply routes, those are things which matter far more in battle than how fast someone can shoot. So pushing this narrative of speed shooting being important in battle ultimately doesn't matter because the archers were not used in battle all the time. The battles where we do see archery use, it's harassment. Um, I'll, I'll cite a couple of examples. We know Agincourt is like the famous example in, in English archery, but even that wasn't necessarily fast. It was just like French people slipping over muddy ground. So the English could spend like all day shooting at them if they had to. Um, the best longbow battles were like um, uh, Battle of uh, Falkirk, where the English simply stood on the hills and shot the Scottish Schultrums. They were vulnerable. They didn't have any threat to shoot super quickly. But if you look at the Middle East, the Arab archers, which are the source of speed shooting according to most texts, well, some of the biggest battles where archers were effective, let's say uh, the Battle of Hatin, uh, we have Salah ad -Din. He uh, he's, uh, he's harassing the Crusaders under Gide Lusignan, he's burning their camps, they're shooting arrows all night, but they're marching in this column for an entire day they're shooting sporadically for an entire day, not speed shooting, because they're, they're not doing hidden runs. They simply go on high ground, bombard them with arrows, go back, get more arrows, come back and shoot them more. There's no speed element. They didn't need to. Not when you have hundreds and thousands of archers. Similarly, Saladin versus Richard the Lionheart, Battle of um, Asuf. We'll see uh, the, the, the Muslim archers were constantly harassing the Crusaders to the point where they had to walk backwards to their shields. And in the end, the Crusaders would fight, charge, the Templars or the, or the Hospitallers would break, the, break ranks and charge and win the battle. So the archers not decide, they were there to harass, they were quite important to make their life miserable, but they didn't win the battle. Um, battle of Ain Jalut, when the, uh, it was the Mamluks versus the Mongols. Massive archery battle, horse archers, foot archers, massive archery battle. But it's a large scale. It's not one person trying to be a hero and shoot quickly. One side didn't win because they shot faster. It doesn't work that way in battle. Battle is about tactics and logistics, not about who shoots faster. Uh, in a modern sense, it's like, well, in World War II, America didn't win the war because they had an M1 Garand. And the Germans had a single, uh, had a bolt action and car 98K. It wasn't, that wasn't the reason why they lost. It might have given a situational advantage at a particular time, and it might have made usability easier, which was a soft factor, but it didn't decide the outcome of battles or wars. No battle was won because one side had like eight bullets and one side had five bullets. 
the battle wasn't won because one side had uh, had a semi-auto rifle, one, one side didn't. Because the big picture is the Germans didn't need a semi-auto rifle when their entire squad was based around the machine gun. And likewise, in med- medieval combat, historical battles, the army wasn't always built around the archer. The army was built around the foot soldier, the line infantry, uh, the cavalry. The archer was only one part of the big picture. And in that giant war machine, an individual skill doesn't matter as much. They would have training to make sure people could do it, but it didn't matter in the big picture if you could shoot five of us in a second or you shoot one per two seconds or something. It didn't matter that much. And if it did matter that much, that brings to my last point. If archers were so good, if speed shooting was so effective, why do we have zero evidence of any feats of archery? If archers were that decisive, surely they must be texts which record battles that chronicle how the army of Saladin were like ninjas jumping around, shooting arrows left, right and centre, a hundred arrows per person, ten arrows per second, and they would slaughter all the armies the crusaders. Now, we don't have any of that. And people, people actually do defend this. They'll say, oh, well, a lot of things were lost. There are a lot of things we don't know about historical archery. That, that, that's why it's forgotten. If it doesn't exist, we can't say that it was there. We don't know, and there's no proof it did. This is the basics of historical reasoning. This is why we go to history, not school and archery, to talk about history. Yes, somebody today might be able to shoot 10 arrows in 5 seconds, but that doesn't mean someone back then did, or could, or would have wanted to. So these lack of sources which show any specific accounts, because if someone was that good, surely someone would talk about it. If archers had that much impact because of speed shooting, somebody must have mentioned it. If not the enemy source, then their own sources. Surely the Arab writers would exemplify how great battles were because these archers could shoot really quickly. Because there's no evidence, we can't say something didn't happen, but I don't see much evidence to support something did. I don't see much evidence saying that speed shooting did or could have happened in this way, because there's nothing which proves it. So ultimately, this is the conclusion on why speed shooting has problems. More so with the understanding of speed shooting, not the practice of it. Again, I'm not saying you shouldn't do speed shooting. Anyone who dedicates time to the pursuit of perfection in any form is respectable. That's why when I see speed shooting, I am wowed. I am impressed. I think it is amazing. I think it is skillful. Where things get iffy is how people apply speed shooting. Now, speed shooting is first and foremost an exhibition skill. The ability to shoot quicker than you would normally shoot is something intended to show off to other people how good you are as an archer. It doesn't mean you would do it in battle. So, things like speed shooting, the three hours in one second, that, that particular feat is not referenced in context. It's simply saying that, oh, uh, a Mamluk archer should be able to do this. doesn't say how or why or when, just say they should do this. Is this a test of dexterity or a test of shooting? That's a big difference there. Nonetheless, a lot of the things we read in these texts are from exhibition or stunt shooting sections. People get offended when we say it's trick shooting because trick shooting carries this negative connotation. It's not. Trick shooting or stunt shooting or exhibition shooting is for entertainment. It's a show-off skill. You're showboating. It doesn't mean you would actually do it in a real situation. As we said before, it may be plausible that someone could do it, but it didn't mean that it was practical, that it had an actual application in a real situation. Further, speed shooting is actually quite exclusive. Now, I did specify at the very beginning that the myth is historical archers shot three arrows in one and a half seconds. This is quite misleading because it is specifically an Arab text which claims this, and that's all. 
virtually no other texts from other cultures mention this level of speed. And in fact, if anything, it, it, they discourage speed. Um, when you look at the styles used by English text, um, the style used by Gao Ying, these are much more about technique, form, drawing, and power, much less about speed. There is almost no speed discussion at all. So, we said before, absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence, but going what we have, when one text barely mentions speed, alongside four other pillars, and pretty much every other text that mentions speed at all, was speed shooting a prevalent technique. As we said before too, um, the idea of speed is largely irrelevant to historical warfare. Again, the, the speed of an individual would not impact the battle. And lastly, and going to the point raised on my final discussion, that is, uh, is it possible to have speed shooting as a thing? The main challenge is, how do you define speed shooting? Because it's not a recognized discipline, it is very much a niche pursuit. And like I said, it is a respectable pursuit for people who choose to specialize in this and are able to demonstrate great skill. There's nothing wrong with being good at something. Uh, there's no reason to be jealous of that. Where it gets issue, the issue is, if you're going to make it competitive, you need a standard set of rules where people agree and follow, and there needs to be a reason to do it. Of all the specialisms of archery, speed is perhaps the least interesting. While it looks the flashiest, it's the least interesting. Because ultimately, what you're testing is your knocking speed, not your shooting speed. Whereas the other extremes, things like power, can be measured in draw weight. Things like um, accuracy are measured in sport target shooting. These are more in line with archers because archers had to shoot heavy bows, had to shoot accurately. Speed is of the golden triangle, speed, power, and accuracy. Speed is the least important one. Not saying it's not important, but the least important. So a competition which pushes speed above all else, questionable. But if it does exist, it needs rules. It needs to agree on distance, technique, accuracy. Otherwise, it does become a bit of a joke where all you do is flip arrows with no account for anything else. So that's my discussion on the multiple problems I see with speed shooting. Anyway, post your thoughts below. Thank you for your patience in watching this. I hope you find it interesting. If you do want to see more deep dives like this in this format, then let me know below. Um, these take some time to make, but again, the effort's more into kind of structuring how it works out rather than trying to film a documentary with like demonstrations. Um, I can do it with you know, sitting at home rather than in my cold shed in the club. Um, but I hope you find it interesting. Anyway, hope you like it. Post your thoughts below. Thanks for watching, and maybe we'll see you next time.